Okay, let's get started. Um, thank you so much to everyone who's came. And good evening, my name is April Hamilton. I am a researcher and engagement volunteer at the Sikh Human Rights Group, an NGO with special consultative status at the United Nations Economic and Social Council. I'd like to thank you all for attending this online seminar where we'll be discussing mental illness in Black and Indigenous communities in the United States. We have several experts with us today, including Ms. Michelle Martin and Ms. Catherine Delgado from the American Association of Suicidology. Founded in 1968 by Dr. Edwin S. Schneidman, the American Association of Suicidology is a non-for-profit organization that researches suicide preventative measures. The organization takes a multi-dimensional approach to addressing the issue, including implementing crisis intervention centers, educating communities, and coordinating training programs to equip volunteers and healthcare professionals with the necessary tools to prevent suicide. Their work is not solely limited to suicide prevention, but also includes the study and treatment of mental illnesses and the way that specific communities are affected. Today, we have Ms. Michelle Martin, who works as a training manager, and Ms. Catherine Delgado, who works as a senior director of programs. They both work in a variety of fields relating to suicide prevention and improving the health outcomes of various populations. We also have Dr. Shervin Asari. He's an associate professor and researcher with the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science in Los Angeles. Prior to his current position, he was a faculty member at the University of Michigan and the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Asari received his Master of Public Health from the University of Michigan and medical degree from the Shackward University of Medical Sciences. He's received many awards, including becoming a fellow at the Scientific Association for Public Health in Iran. His research and clinical interests lie in the observation of patterns of mental health disorders in Black and Indigenous people of color. Dr. Catherine McKinley has been a social professor, researcher, and social worker at the Tulane University School of Social Work since 2013. Her work focuses on family health, women's health, sex differences, violence, and mental and behavioral health, and the historical oppression of Indigenous peoples. Indigenous communities face unique stressors, thus this has encouraged Dr. McKinley to explore the various ways in which non-Indigenous people can work for such communities to improve health outcomes. As she specializes in the health of indigenous communities, she continues to conduct extensive research in tribal communities and working, is working to develop evidence-based programs to prevent substance abuse and violence in the aforementioned communities. She's dedicated to taking a pluralistic approach to such issues by catering to the particular needs of these communities. The work that she does incorporates a wellness approach in the mental and physical and spiritual approaches of health. We also have Mr. Gabriel Johnson, who is a fourth year doctoral candidate in health behavior and health education at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He focuses on the experiences of black men and how the intersection of heterosexism, racism and gender influences their mental health. By using critical methodologies, he aims to create a culturally based approach to inform research and intervention to improve the lives of black men. Such approaches have included feminist practices, participatory action research and community engagement models. Now that we have an introduction to our panelists, let's really have an idea of what mental illness is. It can be very loosely defined as a health condition that changes a person's thinking, feeling or behavior resulting in distress and challenges to their day-to-day -day lives. There are a variety of mental illnesses and the severity of them exists on a spectrum. The cause of mental illness varies, but they're generally the result of biology, early adverse life experiences, serious um, chronic conditions, and negative reinforcement. Now that we have introductory understanding of mental illness, let us consider the impact that it has worldwide. One in four people will experience a mental health condition in their lifetime, and roughly one million will lose their lives to suicide a year. In the United States, suicide is the 12th leading cause of death and the second leading cause of death amongst 15 to 24 year olds worldwide. No ethnic group or otherwise has an innate predisposition towards mental illness, but disparities in healthcare opportunities, depending on race, economic background, geographical location, et cetera, can result in differing health outcomes. Mental illness is a serious public health issue and requires an organized societal, community, and interpersonal response. In the case of the Black community, they also face specific stressors. As of 2019, those that identify as Black make up 14% of the United States population, or 46.8 million people. The Black population is incredibly diverse, including African Americans, Afro-Latinos, first-generation African immigrants, etc. Unfortunately, years of slavery and 
organized efforts to disenfranchise the Black community continue to be reflected in today's society. This is especially the case with policies such as redlining that essentially restrict individuals to certain neighborhoods, almost always on the basis of race. The term originates from home ownership programs during the New Dare era in the 1930s, which sought to increase housing accessibility. As these programs developed, policies were implemented that resulted in discriminatory housing practices, such as redlining. These programs have a long lasting impact in terms of the aforementioned community to access to accessible, affordable, and quality health care. And that impact is reflected in the following four statistics. Black Americans living below the federal poverty line are two times more likely to report a serious psychological stress than those living two times above the poverty line. So the suicide rate of Black children between 5 and 12 years old is almost twice than that of white children. More than 25% of Black children exposed to violence are at risk of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. One in 10 Black men are put in solitary confinement before the age of 32. Indigenous communities, while similar to Black communities somewhere, face unique stressors as well. They are defined by the United Nations and Department of Economic and Social Affairs as people and nations that have had a historical continuity with pre-invasion and pre-colonial societies that developed on their territories. They consider themselves distinct from other sectors of the societies now prevailing in those territories, or part of them. 2% of the U.S. population defines, identifies as Indigenous, while 19% experience mental illness. Similar to the Black community, Indigenous peoples face unique stressors. Those include racism, discrimination, etc., which are the result of centuries of colonialism and the loss of language and culture. One factor that is especially impactful is the fact that 54% of Indigenous people live in rural areas, limiting access to essential healthcare resources. These include therapy, psychiatric treatment, and general medical services. This results in a high suicide rate within the indigenous population. Since 1999, the US suicide rate has increased 33% overall. For American Indian men and women, it has increased 139% and 71% respectively. Today's online seminar will explore the factors that contribute to worsened mental health outcomes in black and indigenous people of color and the various ways that members of civil society can help mitigate this mental health practice. So let's start off with the questions. What are the unique characteristics of mental health in Black and Indigenous people of color communities? Dr. Shervin Asari, could you please begin? Thank you very much, April. I appreciate the opportunity. So uh, we can discuss multiple aspects of mental health problems in Black communities compared to other groups as being different. One is what correlates with it. For white population, usually education, income, employment, protect heavily prevalence or against prevalence of depression and suicide. In the, under racism, because education is of lower quality, in labor market, there is labor market discrimination and the employment is not the same employment and so forth. The protective effect of those social determinants on resources are weekend for any non-white population, particularly for Black community. So if you conduct a nationally representative study to see who is more likely to be depressed and more suicidal, you find a poor white who is at risk, but you also find that high socioeconomic status, sorry, Black men and Black women remaining at risk. So one is the social patterning of depression in the society changes because of racism. The second one is that uh, how it manifests because uh, historically black communities have and some other minority groups have uh, needed to re retain some uh, aspects of life, including positive emotions, regardless of all the difficulties. For that reason, the depression, so when you look at the depressed white and depressed black individuals, you find that depression doesn't present as, as or in the same way for white and blacks, and you find higher level of positive emotions in black individuals who are depressed compared to whites who are depressed. So for example, hope, we have conducted a study to compare level of hopelessness and hope in white and black individuals with depression and without depression and we 
have observed that any positive emotion, including hope, remains high in Black people with depression. So that means if your criteria for diagnosis is heavily focusing on the what is done in white community as research and white middle class, you would probably misdiagnose depression and many other conditions in uh, communities of color, particularly black community. So that's one another area. Uh, another thing is that because depression is diagnosed later and because depression would not result in treatment and seeking care as to white community, depression among black community in black community is more severe. So the same, so if you have 100 random black patients who have depression and you have 100 white patients with depression, the, the severity of symptoms are higher. So it is less diagnosed, but more severe. And there are also other uh, conditions, for example, that the uh, black patients who have are depressed and need social welfare, for example, using a food stamp or other, they are also uh, more, even more depressed compared to other groups. So th there are unique features uh, of depression in Black community that makes it distinct from other populations. Thank you so much. Sure. Dr. Catherine McKinley, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. And, and I do want to um, honor the Indigenous Peoples Ancestral Lands who I reside upon here in the Louisiana, New Orleans area, um, United Home Nation, Mississippi, Anishinaabe Indians, and other tribal communities here. Um, and I'll primarily be speaking about, you know, uh, Indigenous peoples from the from the U U.S. And so before I kind of answer that, um, I, you know, really appreciate um, our last speaker's kind of presentation of just kind of, you know, we look at mental health or mental illness, which is really a, you know, a social construction based on our historical context. And I live on a world in a world, you know, I have settler colonial background, you know, based on the construction of whiteness, right? That um, even though my my ancestors came from Ireland and were considered non-white for, you know, like this construction has changed based on settler colonial colonial types of um, needs. And what that means is that you know, there's imperialism and there's settler colonialism when people come into a land to make it their own. And to do that, they need to erase and replace indigenous peoples, their life, life ways, their worldviews. And they also need a, it's kind of a tripartite model with um, also the need of chattel slave slaveries. And so there's a whole hierarchy, feminized labor force, all of these things um, have, we've created, you know, categories of whiteness and blackness and um, indigenous peoples, you know, um, you know, different, different kind of terminologies, um, which has created a hierarchy of treatment and cumulated, cumulative oppression and um, structural oppression and poverty and um, efforts to erase and replace these kind of the ideology. And so the whole kind of construct of mental health and illness is a social construct. And it has been tool, you know, uh, interestingly here in the U.S., um, the you know uh, the White House has just issued a statement or a memorandum of guidance for federal departments on H agencies on indigenous knowledge, and because one one part of colonization is to um, you know marginalize indigenous knowledge, it, um, there's efforts to kind of redress that. And I just want to read this, but this is from the memorandum of the, of the White House that came out um, in November of last year. At times, Western science has been used as a tool to oppress tribal nation and indigenous peoples. Unethical research abuses and the use of uh, genetic data without their knowledge or consent, as well as pseudoscience to embody the eugenics movement. So how this has been embodied is kind of dehumanizing people to be, uh, you know, who are these poor, you know, alcoholics or these people who, you know, are not um, doing well because not recognizing the social context that has created, um, you know, violence basically that um, has changed the the the, the well being. Um, and they mentioned that this marginalization has resulted from a lack of awareness, unfamiliarity with, and method, method, methodological dogma, and often too often racism and imperialism. And so it's really important that when we talk about mental health and, and kind of um, other things that we understand the socio-political construct of this and how it was adapted from biological types of science. Um, and kind of the part of that is to remove the context and to not um, understand holistically that's 
historical context of structural violence that has caused disadvantage, which manifests in different ways and cultural ways and are measured based on whiteness and in, in Western, you know, I'm based on kind of a, a male Western um, view of what psychology is. Um, and so I guess the, the, to sum all that up is the differences are, you know, structural oppression. And this comes to different groups, especially BIPOC people in different, different ways, which causes different quality of life and um, ways of understanding them. And sometimes, you know, when there's an over focus on just mental health and, and things like that, um, there can be like damage centered research, which kind of reify or reproduce this idea that these people are, you know, inferior or sick and that kind of thing. So I'm going to, uh, that's my cue to pass it on. Thank you so much, um, Dr. McKinley. Now, Mr. Johnson, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Asari, Dr. McKinley. You kind of like laid out some of the the core things, and I'll probably I'll I'll take time right now to kind of get into um, talk about Black folks and particularly some of the unique intricacies that kind of highlight um, about why mental health is different. So Dr. Sari, so Dr. McKinley kind of lays out this like groundwork about like the social conditions, right, and how things are kind of socially constructed in the United States in particular. Um, and Dr. Asari talks about how um, as a result of the the Black experience in the United States. Um, many things are kind of shaped very differently, right? For example, um, Dr. Sari talks about, and actually a report just came out by NYU, I think in December, um, that Black women's, uh, Black women's like um, symptoms of depression look distinctly different, right? There's higher levels of irritability, um, sleep deprivation, which is a very different from like what we say standard, standard things such as depressed mood, uh, lethargy, and those type of things. Um, also, that those things also look different among Black men, right? Which Black men historically will um, kind of work themselves to the bone, or what we say, John Henryism, which is a, an example of like really working to excess, ideally, or in particularly in the subcontext of like working against oppression, right? So, hey, this person says, I'm working in corporate America. Um, I'm getting all these messages that says I cannot make it to manager or district manager, right? I, Gabriel Johnson, am, I have a two and a half year old at home. I'm married, right? I, have, I take care of my family, my grandma, and stuff like that. I'm going to go above and beyond work extra hours, all these type of things, and like in, in particular excess um, that, are, that are creating additional strain on my body, right? And additional stress, right? Which ends up shortening life, uh, life expectancy. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Sorry, other people can talk about some of the telomere length and those kind of um, additional processes. Um, but additionally, the thing I want to kind of give additional context to is an area that I focus on is Black sexual minorities, right? Um, which also looks very, very, very different mental health wise in comparison to, we'll say, majoritarian populations such as white, white LGBT populations. For example, um, religion and spirituality is deeply, deeply important. Actually, pretty by and large, statistically speaking, to um, BIPOC sexual, uh, sexual and gender minority groups. Um, across the board, which is actually not necessarily the case in white sexual and gender minority groups. Um, histor historically, and even like, like the social context in general, like um, media, there's a, there's a thought that if you're a sexual minority and you're, and you're religious, right, that religion is actually an additional lens or additional uh, access of oppression, right, making you additionally more stressed because if I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim, all these other different denominations of religions, these people do not accept me, and therefore I am feeling additional stress. Where conversely, partially as a result of the history, like history of oppression um, and some of these cultural practices, um, particularly black sex, black sexual and gender minorities, so black lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals find religion as a source of strength. And it actually is it's actually it's demonstrated largely with mixed results, but more recently has shown that uh, increased religiosity, right? So a sense of religion, going to church find yourself as highly religious or at least moderately religious is associated with improved mental health, which is actually the almost distinct reverse um, in many uh, white LGBT populations. Um, so I think that's one of, I think it's another one of the ways to kind of look at like how mental health among BIPOC communities is distinctly different, right? As like I said, as I want to re reinforce that what Dr. McKinley says is that this history and how so, and like the social context is deeply important in how we understand this, right? And as Dr. Asari kind of kind of clarified, it leads to actually really misunderstanding a lot of times how we understand one um, how mental illness may show up in these populations, particularly Black folks, 
right? How depression shows up, how anxiety shows up. Um, historically speaking, even how schizophrenia shows up. Um, um, and then additionally, which we'll talk to in a little bit is um, it kind of gets construed because it, the, due to these like social constructions and how the social processes is set up in the United States, it also impacts and, and reinforces certain narratives because of how people first enter mental health and formal mental health process, formal mental health like support and things like that. So I'll leave that because that'll be the next question, but um, I'll stop there just for a second time. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Now, Ms. Michelle Martin, um, in terms of just unique characteristics of mental health in BIPOC communities, what has your research shown? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I'm gonna take that one, if that's okay. Um, Catherine Delgado here from American Association of Suicidology. And thanks for having us here today to talk about this from our, our macro lens, our community engagement and research lens. Um, we, when we think about this, we're coming from this in the lens of a lens of training and accreditation and what, how social services are engaged with and delivered and how clinicians are trained and what that research looks like, right? So from the moment um, that we are even using words like best practices and, and evidence-based data research and equity. Um, does that even match the population in which we're gonna try um, to pursue that treatment with, right? So um, we are going, coming from the lens that um, many social workers and psychologists and, and folks who might be delivering these services might have a lack of training in suicidality in, in general. So then there really is going to be sort of a, a disconnect in any um, intersex and in any group populations in suicidology. So it's really important to us that we're, we're coming from a lens where when we look at how social services are being delivered, are they being delivered in a culturally appropriate way from a person who has been trained by elders, let's say for example, in the indigenous community, if we have a group who wants to deliver best practices, first, are those best practices applicable in the situation? And second, does this person um, have the years it takes and, and the backing from the community in which they're trying to serve? So we're, we're going to see that these differences are going to make a difference in the whole continuum of care. So um, to your point, um, Gabriel, how they enter uh, services, how those are delivered, how, what clinicians are, are, are chosen to interact with particular groups. Um, a promising thing that is helpful to us necessarily is seeing um, some, some federal funding come down and, and bring some awareness to these situations. So we, we really need to make sure that when we're recommending resources that all of these resources have included all of these things. Um, so that we're not delivering things in a way um, that harm these differences. So we're going to make sure that language barriers are taken into consideration. We're going to make sure that um, the mistrust has been taken into consideration. Um, we're going to make sure that um, challenges that are seen where you're making decisions for another group of people um, can be lessened in this case. And it really does make a difference in terms of outcomes. So if we are going to have all these clinicians out in these world, um, having all of these interactions with these groups, um, we do know that there, there is no such thing as best practices. There is no such thing as evidence-based if we're not going about this the appropriate culturally way. Wonderful, thank you so much. Now, thank you panelists overall for your answers to that question. That was fantastic.
Now, what are challenges to seeking the utilization of care in Black and Indigenous communities? I'd like to start off with Dr. McKinley. Thank you so much. Um, I'm probably going to be kind of backing up as we kind of uh, focalize and then back up, you know, forward and back a little bit, um, just because I think that, that our ways of knowing really um, affect a lot of this. And so um, I just want to also piggyback a little bit off, um, you know, what, what Gabriel said of, you know, part of this, uh, what I mentioned, the settler colonization um, kind of has imposed a structure of heteropaternalistic and heterosexual, meaning um, a lot of the ways uh, societies have been organized were more matrilineal, egalitarian, fem female-centered oftentimes, and here in the U.S. And so when the settlers came in, they imposed a nuclear family structure, let not kinship, um, kind of separating and fragmenting families um, as well. Um, and so that kind of heterosexism, these kind of things are, people are marked or um, valued differently based on how far of the hierarchical continuum they are from. So like, you know, white heterosexual men are the head of the household, kind of this, you know, father of the nation. That's kind of the structure that we replicate in this nation. And so um, this part of the reasons why, you know, sexual minorities have been devalued is because, you know, how far on that continuum they are. I just want to, to bring that up. Um, the other thing that I, you know, want to, you know, follow up with, uh, you know, Dr. Delgado's, you know, um, you know, intro as well as this cultural relevancy. And so why, you know, to, to the question of why is utilization low, for instance? Um, one, again, kind of going to a broader lens, you know, Western science, for instance, constructs kind of the idea of reality um, as if it's um, universal and not, not another form of local knowledge of like Western European. So a lot of times mental health has been involved kind of a Europeanization of like assimilation of people to a, a localized knowledge that disregards that it's local. And so what kind of indigenous, you know, with indigenous knowledge, the whole point, it has to be connected to somewhere. And that's good for everyone, right? Because no matter if you're localized to a geographic region or, you know, community or urban center, how people, the meaning people ascribe to mental health, the way that they find um, help for that, the, you know, those kind of things are culturally grounded and localized. And what Western kind of science tries to remove is that any idea that it's local, right? It tries to universalize and kind of fit people into a one size fits all. And usually that means not BIPOC people ever, you know, right? <laughs> because it was never constructed for that. It was actually constructed to erase and replace them and dehumanize them. And so it advantages, right? Um, the social reproduction of privilege by, you know, kind of, you know, keeping people down and assimilating people into systems that they can never really succeed in because of all of these disadvantages, economic, you know, social and educational, housing, all of that. Um, and so why people don't utilize services is because usually they're not relevant and they can actually be harmful and um, assimilative. So just, I'll say one more thing before I pass it along. You know, we found that even multicultural um, interventions that are not targeted to cultural groups can either harm people or worsen symptoms. So there's one example of a drug abuse um, multicultural group for adolescents that actually the drug use among adolescents for indigenous peoples um, increased after this. Um, it actually didn't decrease. So, so if we are not doing things in a culturally relevant way, we are likely not helping, but also risking harm and assimilation. Um, a lot of the, if I work in substance abuse, a lot of the treatment methods that um, are used in most treatment centers are based on um, a, a disease model that come from, you know, um, like self-help, but also really Christian, you know, kind of Protestant Christian groups, right? And so, so there's just a very systemic effort of kind of pulling people into a system that ends up um, can causing harm kind of culturally because it re can remove connection to land and um, also culture, which has been found to be protective for mental health, no matter where you are, how connecting with your culture and your roots in your land, these things have been found to be helpful for mental health. Um, but it also is just a, a neo form of colonization. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it along um, to the next person. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. McKinley. Um, Ms. Delgado, what are your thoughts? Thank you so much. Yes, um, there is a real lack of 
resources in in general that are specific toward the group. So um, one of the, there's been a few maybe exciting and very new changes that have happened in the past year in terms of uh, US-wide efforts um, to bring some more groups in. So for example, we've, you know, had the launch of 988, which is a, you know, free service that anyone can dial into. And um, for all its pros and cons, um, again, to um, Kat's point, um, as you have in your parentheses, um, it's not a one size fits all situation. Um, so with that, thankfully, um, there have been some particular um, groups that um, I think Michelle will list in her particular resources um, in the next few questions, um, where there are now things that are branching off to specifically address indigenous folks that call the 988 line so that they can specifically talk to counselors that are specifically from their groups. So um, to, to speak on why some of that utilization might be low, um, just goes back to the, all the same points Catherine made is that if the approach completely eliminates spirituality in the treatment and and when we're talking about suicidality and we're talking about indigenous groups, um, that is, is the most important thing for that topic. So removing that at all, uh, there almost is, is no point to have that conversation because it doesn't honor what they hold valuable and what, what, would, what would move them forward in that conversation. So it is, um, again, a, a harm, it, it can cause more harm um, to assist that way, right? So where we are, we're working with groups with generational trauma here where we have um, removed um, that spirituality, said it's not important, forced assimilation, and, and that is the very thing that we should be addressing and honoring primarily, um, first and foremost. Um, so I, and when there are places that people can feel safe to contact, such as that branch of the 988, where you know that you're going to get someone who is coming um, maybe from the exact tribal area that you are, um, that is the sort of help that we need to be given and not making choices about what that help looks like. We need to match what that help looks like. Um, so although, <laughs> low, of course, I'm, I'm sort of optimistic about what that, um, all of the, the, those funding sources look like and optimistic that um, as, as I've seen over the past 10 or 15 years in nonprofit services, that that is a part of the conversation on who should have the funding, who should be delivering the services, how do, what groups do we choose to give that funding to, what makes sense. Um, so I'm certainly seeing improvements in that area and, and have hope um, that we're providing more spaces for utilization in a way that, that honors um, what people need instead of making harmful choices for them. Thank you so much, Ms. Delgado. Now, Mr. Johnson, um, what are your thoughts in terms of just challenges to seeking the utilization of care in Black and Indigenous communities? Yeah. Um, so I'll take a different approach than I did the last question because I think we've laid out some of the, the longer things, but I, I'm a, I think I'll, I'll contextualize this a bit, right? So I think uh, the conversation about like providing culturally relevant care is like a very new conversation. <laughs> I, I think that's really important. And I want to contextualize that particularly to be like, there have been people that have been doing this work, right? Scholars, practitioners, people on the ground, people that are in the community, right? Um, and it's now become a, a big ground so really NIH and NIMH and different organizations not proper making moves forward, right? So I just want to context contextualize to what Ms. Delgado said. This has like been like the last 10 years, I would say last five to seven, right? It's been like a very big push. Um, and previously there's been like very little in the conversation. So I want to contextualize that. And in addition, black people 
have increasingly started using uh, mental health resources over the last few years, um, and particularly like uh, mental, health, mental health clinicians. Um, Black men still have a very, very large challenge. Um, um, and part of that reason is that many, I believe if I'm not mistaken, two thirds of Black men that's, that have that are in that are seeking mental health professionals, their first exposure is through the incarceration process or through like um, the penal system to be more precise, right? Like you're, you're, you, got, you got arrested for um, abuse or things like that. And then they're, and they're gonna, you're gonna um, um, route it through like seeing a therapist or something of that sort, right? I wanna be clear, while that can be very helpful, that is like a very challenging way to enter the system um, in many different ways as well as also not only those people, right, but vicariously, you have ch your children, uncles, nephews, fathers, mothers, mothers, uncles, things like that are seeing this and are recognizing that this is associated with a certain process, okay? Um, so I think it's really important to highlight. I think additionally, I want to contextualize this conversation that came up during COVID and I'll keep coming up, right, about we'll say medical, medical mistrust. I would say medical deception has happened, really. That's really the flip, right? It's not like people distrust, it's that they've been given evidence to distrust the system. Um, and particularly think about psycho psychology, therapy, mental health, and those type of things, it's important to recognize that I think a little, a little over a century ago, right, for a Black person to want to run away and not be out of bond and be out of bondage was considered a mental illness, right? I want to contextualize that. That's like really important to understand, right? Um, and then in the 60s, right, in the 70s, for a Black man in particular to want to push against the system and be paranoid that the United States government was after them in the midst of ML Martin Luther King Jr. being murdered, right, or assassinated, Malcolm X being assassinated, Sam Cooke, many of these like important figures, um, that there many of these people were thought to be uh, schizophrenic, right? Um, and that's evidence to like medical records. So I wanna highlight that and what that looks like. Additionally, I think one of the big challenges is that black, black men, more recently, and particularly in Black women and Black people in general, really prefer, as the, as Ms. Delgado talked about, like mental health professionals <laughs> or systems that look like them, right? Because that's at least a surface level indication that they have some understanding of the cultural background. That's I mean, that's absolutely true, right? I have had my experiences, right, where I'm like, oh, this is not we are we are not seeing things on the same on the same level, right? That's at least surface level indication. Now let's put that in context. In order to become a clinician or to be in this mental health systems, you have to have higher education, right? We have to, and, and we go before that, we have to do well in K through 12 education or have decently resourced K through 12 education, which we know many black and indigenous folk, young people that go to schools do not have, right? So when we think about this, uh, I think a lot of the challenges is that one, um, there's, like, there's like a lot of historical deception that's been laid out. I think two, I mean, the conversation we can talk about is insurance, um, and particularly for folks that live in high, like high metropolitan areas, there's just, there's not, there's not enough to match the need. Um, and I think within people's right and with our right is that the people that want to be seeking help from people that look like them and can speak to their experiences, right? And I think there's something to be said about people who don't look like them, who do not look like them and are well-versed or are getting trained. That's one aspect. I think it's another aspect for someone who can speak to lived experience. And, and while right now we have like, we're having a groundswell of, of black clinicians that are entering the mental health, mental health workforce, right? That's still a very slow process, right? And we still have many educational systems in the K through 12, which is the first step, right? That are, that are having a hard time even matriculating into, into uh, for your uh, for your degree programs and, and even then matriculating out of those programs to get to some of the higher ed things out, put them in a position to do so. So I think some of the, those are some of the things that are really kind of high that are high that are highlighted. Um, and I'll stop there and I'll pass it on. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Johnson. I really do appreciate it. Now, as previously mentioned, healthcare inequality is especially prevalent. Um, all of you guys have really touched on that. So this really includes access to psychiatrists, therapists, and health facilities. What endeavors are currently being taken to address the mental health of BIPOC communities, both nationally and regionally? And regionally can talk about your particular state or the Midwest, it really depends on what you prefer. I'd like mm -hmm. to start off with Ms. Michelle Martin. Hi, uh, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you to all of the 
uh, panelists that have spoken so far. Um, and first, uh, I want to let you know that I am speaking to you from the state of Georgia, and I want to honor uh, the tribes from the state of Georgia, um, namely the Apalachicola, Catawba, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Chickasaw Nation Creek. So when we're speaking about uh, national endeavors that are uh, have been implemented to um, address our issues, um, first of all, while there are some being implemented, we are seeing some progress here, uh, we still have a ways to go. And I want to recognize that you know, this is not going to be a quick fix. This is, you, you've heard about a lot of um, structural oppression, genera generational trauma. Uh, and so while we're seeing progress, um, I, I remain optimistic that that progress will continue. Uh, so nationally, um, and we see insurance coverage for telehealth as well as the number of visits um, covered being extended when we uh, compare that to our pre-pandemic times. Uh, again, somebody else mentioned it. Um, you are probably aware of the creation of 988 or our suicide prevention lifeline. Um, and as Ms. Delgado mentioned, there is a specific uh, initiative as a uh, branch of the 988 line it's called the Native and Strong Helpline, and that is a crisis helpline that connects Indigenous people with Native crisis counselors who are tribal members or descendants very closely tied to uh, those tribal communities. Um, so those are really great. Um, that, that's a really great thing for us to see. Um, as Ms. Delgado also mentioned, um, we are seeing more federal funding specifically for the BIPOC community. Uh, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, or you may know them as SAMHSA, uh, they have several initiatives within the Office of Tribal Affairs and Policy. Uh, some of those initiatives include the Tribal Behavioral Health Grant, which was created in 2020 for tribes and tribal organizations. Uh, intended to prevent and reduce suicidal behavior and substance abuse and promote mental health well-being. Among your American Indians, Alaska Native, young people to and including 24 years of age. Uh, we also have the Garrett Lee Smith State and Tribal Youth Suicide Prevention Program. Uh, the focus of that program is on implementation of statewide or tribal use to suicide prevention and early intervention strategies. There are grants um, that support public and private collaboration among youth serving institutions, schools, juvenile justice systems, foster care systems, substance abuse and mental health programs, and other child and youth supporting organizations. Um, another that I'd like to talk about is the Circles of Care program. In this program, tribes receive support to increase the capacity and effectiveness of mental health systems serving their communities. Um, so the Circles of Care program has um, grants that focus on reducing the gap between the need for mental health services, the availability and coordination of mental health, substance use, and co-occurring disorders, and the impact of historical trauma. So again, there's a couple of very specific programs that are utilizing um, individuals within the tribal communities um, to train and provide services for uh, the, the community that they identify with. Um, there's not as much regionally going on, but we do have Health and Human Services publishes a list of services specifically related to supporting indigenous communities, and they have a listing that shows services available by state. Um, and again, that kind of goes back to your um, crisis counselors and centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid um, 
tribal affairs um, in which people in those communities can access culturally appropriate services. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ms. Martin. Um, now, I really do appreciate it, and we will definitely make sure to send out these resources. Now, Dr. Catherine McKinley, what are your thoughts in terms of just what's really being undertaken to address mental health in these communities? Uh, I mean, I think we have, thank you for that, you know, that great list of resources. I think like those, those are, um, you know, a wonderful list I don't need to add to really. Um, I, I do want to kind of just em emphasize uh, too the governmental kind of, um, you know, the, the memo of like the incorporating the indigenous knowledge and the policy making. So, um, you know, and I'm speaking because my work is with indigenous peoples, but this, you know, you know, tribal nations, federally recognized tribes, state recognized tribes are sovereign domestic dependent nations, meaning they have, you know, um, like political and sovereignty, you know, to where they can have jurisdiction over their own peoples and lands. Um, and so self-determination matters, right? So like, so, so enabling resources, these governmental efforts, Canada has done a really great job um, of really infusing, you know, indigenous knowledge in the decision-making across these different levels so that people are making decisions, hopefully from those leaders of the nation. Um, now, just because, um, you know, a tribe, not just because is a federal recognized tribe, we shouldn't rely on that requirement for it to allow communities to self-determine how to make progress, whether you're, you know, um, black, by, you know, any any sort of community should, um, you know, be able to self-determine how to help people, you know, within their communities. And so I think that's like a big key. Um, the other thing that's important is to not kind of essentialize like what a, what a certain type of community needs, right? But but to um, follow the consent and the self-determination of the people within those communities that are chosen um, with kind of cultural protocols in mind, meaning cultural insiders, people who know, um, who, are, who are credible, these kind of things. And so there's a way of kind of going about and approaching this, honoring kind of the self-determination of communities. Um, I work with indigenous communities who have political sovereignty in many cases, which there's a federal requirement based on treaty agreements for the land that we live on to provide for the health and well-being of indigenous communities. So that's in exchange for, you know, the, all, every, the land that we now call the United States. Um, however, I want to say this should be happening for everyone, right? Like we should allow communities to self-determine how to how, how to approach these things um, and also to enable capacity. So um, the work that I do, you know, is a lot of community-based participatory research. So like the, the project I've been working on is over a decade long of listening to people, doing a lot of listening and following and seeing what makes sense and, you know, kind of um, helping, you know, with my own background, helping, you know, funnel resources so so the community can direct, you know, how to address these things. And so um, as a, as a non-Indigenous person, I can use my kind of settler colonial background, my education that wasn't available to a lot of people, um, you know, to help funnel resources and infrastructure so that tribes and other communities, right, can make those decisions. And, have, um, and so this is facilitated by community health representatives. Um, and we do a prevention program that's kind of kinship and family-based that supports a lot of the protective factors um, that we found to be important, like culturally, you know, cu cultural centeredness, connection to land, kinship relationships, indigenous knowledge systems and values. Um, and, you know, I would recommend, you know, just in general to learn more about your local indigenous communities, because you know what's happened with kind of Western science and understanding the one size fits all is um, there's there's an erasure of history, um, which you know we have kind of a monopolized way of seeing the world and this kind of ideology, and so and we really need to connect and and with the kind of indigenous knowledge systems to offset this kind of um, lack of awareness that this is a localized knowledge that's gone global, right? And the effects that that has on the, the communities um, that are marginalized by that ideology. And so again, self-determination is, is the message and um, there are governmental um, things happening, but like, you know, we have a long way to go, so. Thank you so much, Dr. McKinley. Now, Dr. Shervin Asari, what is really being undertaken to address the mental health of black and indigenous communities? Yeah, I want to give a few examples. So uh, there are studies published after ACA 
uh, or Obamacare to see what was the effect of Obamacare on uh, the gap, racial gap in mental health problems. And there are substantial evidence suggesting that it increased the gap. So this is the thing that I think policymakers need to do two things. One is to serve the overall population, like reduce the overall problem at the, at the average, and then make sure that the gap doesn't increase. So if based on a lot of the conversation today, we know that universal interventions sometimes have the risk to increase the gap because they may have higher uptake by the privileged group. If one group doesn't have the higher high level of a stigma, then if you just provide access, then that is the group who is going to use the care. So, and, and if you don't fix the other segments of the system, many of our interventions have the potential risk of widening the gap. So we think we are, and we are doing the service, we are reducing the overall uh, problem, but we are, that comes to the, this proportionate uh, advantage of the privileged group. So this is these are type of examples. Another example is that the University of Michigan uh, conducted, a, like recorded what patients do when uh, you tailor, inter tailor your intervention. And they found a number of things. One was that if the subject of the health problem is not stigmatizing, tailoring helps. Like if it is about flu and you tailor pamphlets on flu related to flu, it increases adherence of the minority to the mass messages. But if you do the same thing for HIV, you would reduce their interest in looking at that pamphlet because the population knows that you are working on an stigmatized subject like HIV. So they attribute this to your racism, our racism. So these are a lot, there are a lot of nuances that should be addressed. The problem is we just think without evidence that, okay, Obamacare is going to solve the problem and then uh, years later, you measure it. Jo Joshua Breslau has measured it and showed that it may have increased the gap. Or another example is that we say uh, minority populations are not represented online. So when you try to find a resource online, you don't see your face and your population image, and you don't get interested. And there are randomized trials who have fix that issue and they have increased the representation of minority or non-white images and they have seen that it worsens the problem because the population understand that this, this is not United States um, situation. Something is fishy. I don't buy your argument that, okay, go and seek care. Or another one is that Again, at Vane State, they have put uh, recording, they have recorded the encounter of black patients and white providers. And we know that a black patient who receives care, receive care by, from black provider has higher satisfaction, higher adherence, better outcome mediated because of that higher adherence. But when you try to fix the problem, it doesn't necessarily work. So they worked with a number of white providers who were treating black patients and they tried to, that the black, uh, white provider would have higher eye contact, higher time spent in medical encounter and more patient-centered intervention. And when they measured the outcomes, it was hurting minorities. Why? Because people are not stupid. People understand that this is different than reality of my life. So you can't just fix a small piece of a problem and expect that you would, okay, now diminish the gap. So it's a lot of complexities around things. And again, you can't use, ignore local information, 
apply universal information and that universal information would probably sometimes widen the gap because that matches your privileged group information and needs. So these are a number of complexity that I just wanted to bring up, that it's not easy to solve the problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Sorry. Um, I really do appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Johnson, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you all for sharing. Dr. Sorry, that was like very succinct. I appreciate that. Um, so I get, I, I, I'll keep it local or local and state for the, for the sake of it. So for those who don't know, I live in Michigan. Um, Michigan is home to um, Detroit, which is the uh, the city with the largest proportion of Black people uh, in the United States. Um, so like population wise. Um, so there is a, a unique dance around the politics in Michigan. Um, because that's not necessarily where the money is at, right? So we have to be clear about that. But um, to put that to put this into context, um, there's been a there's been a there's been a decent amount of different efforts. Um, uh, Dr. Sorry talked about some of them, but particularly the ones I'm familiar with are very local. Um, so there's so particularly and particularly in my experience, they're actually fairly gendered for a lot of different reasons because there's pretty differing needs. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm part of uh, Washtenaw County, which is the county I live in, which is where Ann Arbor and University of Michigan is that, my brother's keeper, uh, which is an extension, uh, for lack of a better term, I can go into detail that at a different time, of Obama's initiative of my brother's keeper um, that was to support um, young boys of color. Um, so in these efforts, uh, we take well, this small group of community community-based We'll say community-based leaders that have put up, take on initiatives to have groups. So with black men and boys um, is ideal and usually more conducive um, to, to like reducing mental health, like adverse mental health outcomes, reducing stress, um, at least in the short term. Um, and there's some studies right now that Daphne Watkins, the YB Men Institute, YB Men um, Project at School of Social Work are doing about long-term effects about black men and boys and males getting together and talking about some of these issues in the collective, right? Which is a little different than like our traditional one-on-one -on -one didactic like therapy kind of session. Um, it also helps curb some of the challenges of like, there's a very, there's a very, very, actually very serious dearth of black male clinicians. Um, very serious dearth um, for context in the, in Washington County, there's two. Um, and I know both of them, right? So, um, which impacts my ability to actually seek help. Um, so there's that. Um, additionally, there are there are uh, black clinicians in the Detroit area that are working to actually provide free or really reduced care um, for uh, for people in the area. Uh, another another way I'm in school I'm in public health. Um, Grand Rapids and is really pushing and just got recently a pretty large grant. Um, to advocate and, and train community health workers, um, which is a really, which is kind of reduces the training and the like formality, the formality processes that it takes to be like a PhD or MP or a master's in public health, um, and instead kind of be a, a person who may, who may have a social degree or a bachelor's degree and be, and be interacting with the community strip and, and is a member of the community to engage some of these things. Um, the other thing, uh, which I'm hesitant about, but it's worth noting, right, and it's important to note in the spirit of um, working with Black folks in mental health, police police uh, redirections are really important right now. Um, so right now, um, there's been efforts, particularly in Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti, um, but throughout where um, if there is, if someone calls and there's, and there's an assumption that is um, a mental health crisis, um, which historically, if it's Black folks, for context, my mom is, I, I have a lot of folks in my family with disabilities, disabilities and different disabilities, um, they are more likely to come, like, to die, right, if they get called with a crisis. So what's happening is that um, Black people who are experiencing mental health crises, historically, um, due to lack of resources and lack of resources and funding, get police officers. Um, for context, police officers are actually not largely equipped to even handle these kinds of situations um, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, that's both historical and kind of a, a bit of like the, the scale of what they're expected to do in some way, shape, or form, to be quite honest. Um, so 
Um, there's been funding both in Detroit, um, Ann Arbor, and in Grand Rapids and Flint area, which are pretty like which are areas with some of the highest black populations, um, to employ like a uh, mental health, like a mental health person to de-escalate the situation, right? Which can use nonviolent methods. Um, less um, triggering, right? If you see a police officer coming and you have a psychotic episode, that may be a very different reaction than seeing someone in plain clothes that is not actually here to kind of like um, maybe physically restrain you um, and is maybe trained to de-escalate the situation rather than someone who is not well-trained um, and maybe already in a heightened state as a result of the position otherwise and result of the position, their experiences with people of your background and those side of things. Um, so those are probably the things that I would, I would highlight in the immediate. Um, and like I said, many, many others, many other ones are happening very much on the ground, right? So they're not necessarily these very structured kind of approaches, but they're like uh, community members that are kind of taking it, uh, matters into their own hands. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. Now, what are some professional development resources or opportunities for one to learn about mental health in Black and Indigenous communities? Back to you, Mr. Johnson, if that's okay. No problem, Ms. Hamilton. Um, so I, I I have a I have a couple. Um, it was interesting. I was like, oh, professional development is like it's real challenging. But um, you know, APA has some pretty good resources. They've like really up there. They've really modified a lot of their content over the last five five ten years um, to kind of reflect the structural oppression, um, persistent stress, <laughs> right, and how that shows up, which we kind of, which are really kind of talking about a lot of different ways, which is like racism, heterosexism, and those type of things. Um, Interfaith America is really helpful. Um, this this a resource that I kind of really abide by that's based in uh, Los Angeles called the Black Emotional Mental Health Collective. Um, it's beam.community. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult to find, but they kind of address all aspects, um, all aspects and grounded in different Black cultural practices um, from varying, right? From Christianity to hoodoo um, and some like Western African um, practices, um, as well as also identifying different segments. So there's ones that are gendered, right? So men, women, transgender individuals, as well as folks that are gay, bisexual, les lesbian, um, as well as age different, because all those things really matter. Um, the only thing they don't necessarily have for training is life course, right? Because some of the things people later in life that are, uh, that are uh, particularly after 45 and 50 or have different, different, just something different sets of needs, uh, particularly given the context of where we're at right now in 2023. Um, and then the last few I'll highlight is the Williams Institute, um, which is in University of California, LA, uh, which does a lot of, which is specifically focused and uh, links law, uh, law and policy, um, social behavioral aspects of sexuality and gender, um, and mental health and other aspects, um, and can provides a lot of great insight and data um, folks who are interested in professional development resources, um, and then also the Black Mental Health Alliance, which is one of probably the one organizations probably maybe the closest to like coordinating um, and in conversation with like federal government entities. Um, and then NAMI has some really good resources um, around BIPOC folks in general, kind of helping you contextualize um, what's going on, how to make sense of it, and then also some links about like um, workshops and workshops and um, different uh, different trainings kind of help you be a better equipped teacher, physician, um, mental health practitioner, co-worker in the workplace, um, all different kinds of positions. So those are the kind of things that help for me. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. Now, uh, Dr. McKinley, um, are there any opportunities or any resources that you can really think of? Mm -hmm. I think people have kind of listed, um, you know, the, the NAMI, but also, you know, and NIH, but you know, it, it does keep coming back to kind of local, right? And so like finding, you know, there's not really a one size fit all, but I think, I think, you know, what I found as a person, you know, of settler colonial background, um, having worked in this since 2009, is that, you know, my question has changed over the time, like, how do we help people, right? My question over time has, has come to who needs, who and what needs the intervention? And then, and that really comes usually back to the people who are helping, including the decision makers. And so I think like the professional development is really onerous on the professionals, right? Um, because if we're not learning and becoming critical about um, how decisions are made, who does it benefit? Does this policy that's universal 
increase the gap, like um, Dr. Asari mentioned, um, uh, what, what questions am I asking and not asking? Those kind of things are on professionals and decision makers because that's how things are structured, right? So I think a lot of the issues that we see with mental health um, and even how we, how do we look at mental health, like learn from local indigenous communities, BIPOC people, um, how do they see it, you know? Um, the, the understanding of wellness, things are connected to their, um, to the living and non-living world, the land, the structures. Um, these are, you know, learning about, you know, focusing on a problem and understanding how and why did it get there? Looking at the history, going far, going far into history, where did this come from? It's, it's fascinating. It's not only, it's good, we all need it because what's happening is we're replicating the same knowledge system and we're not becoming critical thinkers. We're forgetting that the context matters. And instead of, you know, un understanding and uncovering and, and learning really through a dialogue and a collective dialogue, we're just replicating this kind of inert knowledge that, you know, isn't really meaningful for people. And so I really liked what, um, you know, Gabriel said about, you know, collective kind of dialogue. What, what we, we use that community health representative model trying to, you know, nurture the professional development of local leaders. So like anytime we can use our own privilege to, to funnel resources and infrastructure back to communities so that leaders can continue to develop and lead their, you know, own people. Um, but we also you use a culturally relevant modality of like the talking circle, which ends up being kind of a critical dialogue. And, and you know, some of what comes out is, you know, the problem, you know, when people are have been told for centuries that they're the problem, and let me tell you how and why. And, you know, let's look at, you know, like, let's look at um, uh, intelligence, right? So intelligence was, you know, created in a way that disadvantages people that are, you know, BIPOC, really. And so it's been used as a tool to be like, see, you know, they're uh, less, you know, in, in, you know, inferior. So, you know, so th these kind of ways of seeing things have been used as a tool to continue oppression. We need to know that, otherwise we're being complicit in it. And, you know, no matter what background, you know, you come from, we live in a world structured by settler colonization. So, you know, you know, we're not immune, we live in the world, right? And the way that we've tried to approach thing is to fragment, separate, and act like the rest of the world doesn't exist. So we have to kind of come back to that harmonizing way of understanding things in context with, and, I, and I'd recommend like working with indigenous communities and learning from those knowledges because it's, it's by definition local, you know, wherever it is, no matter where you are, it's local and it's subjugated across the world. So when you understand how and why knowledge has been subjugated and how that affects which, whatever you're doing, whatever that problem is and dig deep, you will uncover a lot. And it's amazing because we can also see how everyone has been oppressed and hurt by the system that we might be replicating without knowing it. And so it's really important as professionals who have the privilege to get an education, right? Um, to make sure we're understanding that power dynamic. And that means going deep, looking at the historical context, listening, creating space and meetings for other people to make decisions that don't, that are not looking like me in the white, you know what I mean? Like making space for other people to talk and then us sometimes being quiet. And I'm saying me as a white person, okay? So um, those are, that's what I would say, but it's an honor and wonderful to hear everyone's um, insights throughout this whole uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Um, now, Ms. Michelle Martin, um, what are some opportunities that you would recommend? What are some that are available to really learn about BIPOC mental health? So again, um, I don't think that it can be said enough that a deep, deep shift is required um, in order for the um, appropriate uh, professional development um, opportunities to, to exist. Um, so one of the um, initiatives that I want to talk about uh, is decolonizing therapy. So there's an organization, decolonizingtherapy.com, um, done by uh, Dr. Jennifer Mullen. And this uh, organization offers a lot of group immersions, uh, webinars, um, immersives for C-suite executives, uh, mini retreats, 
that really draw from healing justice and liberation psychology frameworks, including wisdom from their elders and from spiritual traditions, um, things that are very important to uh, be integrated into um, the trainings in which we're trying to um, support indigenous communities. Um, there's also the ICCTC or Indian Country Child Trauma Center, again, funded by SAMHSA. Um, it offers a training program to provide specialized training to mental health and behavioral health professionals working in Indian country. Uh, the training um, specifically uh, to native populations and unique characteristics of tribal people. Uh, there's webinars and toolkits um, based on uh, trauma-informed care, treatment protocols, outreach materials, uh, service delivery guidelines, while, while incorporating native cultural perspectives and traditions. Um, so uh, attempting to include individuals within the community to support the community. Um, SAMHSA also has Tribal Training and Technical Assistance Center, offers training and technical assistance on mental and substance use disorders, suicide prevention, mental health promotion using strategic cultural framework. Uh, examples of their offerings include the to live to see the great day that dawns, a culturally appropriate guide for empowering tribal youth. And another example, Aboriginal Youth, a manual of promising suicide prevention pra um, practices. Uh, the American Psychological Association uh, has a stress and trauma toolkit for treating indigenous people. It was developed to help providers understand unique circumstances facing historically marginalized po populations and the impact that the current socio-political climate in the United States has on their mental health. Uh, Suicide Prevention Resource Center, um, developing models that are culturally based to promote mental health and prevent suicide for future generations. Um, again, it, it cannot be overstated uh, that it requires a deep, deep shift in uh, the work and uh, it's, it's not meant to be a Band-Aid or, you know, checking the box. Um, those are, it, it's, it's, it's next to impossible. I, you know, like this is a, a grassroots boots on the ground, take lots and lots and lots, I mean, decades of work uh, going into this in order for us to move the needle at all. Thank you so much, Ms. Michelle Martin, and thank you, esteemed panelists. We will now open the Q&A for questions from the audience. So Bethan, I'm ready when you are. I'm not sure if my video is working. And hi, thank you so much for that. That was really interesting. Um, there we are. Um, yes, so I don't know if any of the audience have any questions, but I also have some that people have emailed in. So um, while people I'm sure are having a thing, you can either kind of pop them in the chat or if you want to put your hands up, um, and uh, April can kind of uh, unmute you. But um, yeah, if you also wanted to share any links, that would be really helpful for anyone who wants to uh, to access them um, at the moment. I'll start off with a question while we are waiting. So I'm also with, uh, yeah, with Carlos and April at the Seek Human Rights Group. So a big kind of concept of what um, we're trying to pursue at the UN is is definitely a change in language to try and encourage more pluralistic language um, rather than what we often see at the UN and national level, which is obviously universalistic language where we kind of, you know, constantly reinforce this hegemony and this idea that unless stated otherwise, um, if someone is being referred to, kind of we assume that they are talking and working and working towards making the world easier for, you know, white cisgender middle class men. And women kind of fall into that, but you know that's kind of the the, the normalised thing. And I think this conversation has really highlighted that 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 is really prevalent in mental health. And actually, often, you know, those are the, usually the the least likely people who need 
the kind of immediate mental health um, advice and and access, particularly at affordable rates. So I guess open to to all panelists, whoever kind of wants to answer, or if you all want to. But do you kind of see in the work you're doing this as an issue that is going to is is getting better or um, yeah, particularly in the US, obviously, where your background's, but is this something that you see um, getting better or is it something that is being completely neglected and there isn't kind of any room for improvement at the moment or rather there isn't any improvement happening? I don't, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to answer that in particular. I would say that, you know, the when I'm seeing the governmental agencies and, and reviewing grants from Canadian that where there is an integration um, um, to incorporate indigenous knowledge, knowledges and decision making, you know, that shows me there's some room, there, there's some progress, but we, I feel like they're, you know, it's just the beginning, right? And like, I, so I think that uh, what that means is that as people um, become you know, more aware and people of, particularly people of privilege um, who hold the privilege status. I'm saying this because um, BIPOC people and other people are already carrying a huge overburden of everything, right? Yeah. So when people who have privilege um, can speak and learn to speak, you know, um, against, you know, or, or, you know, to counter the system, to have a counter narrative, narrative um, I think that's going to continually need to be brought to the center in these kind of decision-making meetings and to the consciousness, right? And so I think uh, that is what, what needs to be done and what can be done, um, but it has to be um, kind of direct, right? So it, like, I like, you know, using words like the hegemony, and it, like, you know, we have to say what it is, right? Yeah. Because um, I think when people are afraid to talk about these things, um, even when they hold privilege, right? Because they've been taught to, we've, we've been taught not to and socialized not to, um, you know, nothing's going to change. And I, I meant to mention this is somewhat unrelated, but I, I believe from my work that the, the, the majority of the distress caused mental health is caused by structural determinants and telling people they're bad, they're wrong. You know, so I think that is, discri we know that discrimination is horrible for mental health, right? Yeah. But like more broadly, I actually think if we address structural determinants of health, that a lot of our mental health will evaporate because it's socially constructed, internalized, and embodied mentally and physically and socially. Mm -hmm. And so I actually think the driver is this in many ways. And that um, I personally experienced, you know, when I uncover the, the or origin of distress, it evaporates, right? Because I know socially constructed. Now, I'm not saying that the, the social you know, structure does not change, but my awareness of where I sit in that and, and that I wasn't wrong the whole time, whatever that means, right? So I think it's important to have collective dialogues with people, you know, having with each other, but also with decision makers and continue to um, get to the drivers, the upstream determinants of health and mental health. Yeah, and that sounds great. I think as well, it sounds like, um, yeah, being gaslit in a lot of circumstances is something that will obviously contribute to a lot of uh, mental health conditions in the sense of just second guessing how you feel and not validating your own feelings and I think that that is on the position of of yeah the people who you know fit into that he hegemony effectively have to you know it's not normalizing the actions but it's normalizing this is actually fair this is why you would feel this way and that's not okay that this is happening but no that's a really um interesting point I don't know if anyone else wanted to add to that at all but um otherwise I'll kind of move on to the next question um so the other part as well I suppose is um I'm not sure if anyone is maybe more involved in the education system and kind of training to become a therapist or at least work in the mental health sphere but is that something that, you know, there is almost modules on that now? Of course, as you said, you know, in theory, a therapist could have um, any person who's their client. And it's like, well, how on earth would you understand any of their feelings if you are a white person, for instance, treating, you know, anyone from a different community? You, you, you know, it's, it's not, you know, you're not always going to relate to your clients, whoever they are, but particularly if you are never going to face racism or never going to face sexism or anything like that. You know, what, what sort of, I guess, training is there for therapists to at least be 
there for that person until they can maybe find someone who can give them even more advice or validate their feelings more, et cetera. So I think um, that kind of speaks to some of the, the examples that I was giving in the my answer in the last question, um, decolonizingtherapy.com, um, a, a vast resource that really draws from uh, wisdom from elders and spiritual traditions and honoring um, our their ancestors and um, the the historical uh, trauma that has been um, happening for yeah. generations. Um, but also um, a couple of the other examples I gave, um, SAMHSA has a number of them through the Tribal Training and Technical Assistance Center. Um, but I, I also just want to say, um, we are starting to see some incentives uh, be offered to uh, BIPOC community um, in order to uh, pursue a career in mental health um, and behavioral health uh, so that we can kind of, you know, close that gap a little bit on the lack of diversity that we see within the behavioral health pro professionals um, and hopefully to be able to move the needle a little bit on that um, uh, utilization of care. Um, so I know that there's, uh, SAMHSA offers a fellowship program um, and there's a couple of organizations that offer incentives. Uh, I think Kaiser Permanente is, is one of the uh, incentive providers. So I think if we could see more organizations and more awareness of the programs um, incentivizing uh, people within BIPOC community to pursue the, the career path. Um, I think that that would help us to see a little bit more, more progress. Yeah, of course. With those resources, are they um, effectively available for people once they have Kind of qualified as therapists or at least are working within the, the um, kind of mental health sphere or is it something that they are kind of you know modules or parts of their qualification now that are being encouraged to so you kind of have to learn it is compulsory or is it that people are you know if you want to be a better therapist or someone who works in the mental health sphere they are actively having to kind of you know just build on that is it is it is it an optional thing or is it now people are you know it is it is compulsory if if, if you're going to be a therapist you need to be able to you know, speak to the masses, not just, you know, the people who look like you effectively. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that I can um, speak accurately to that, but my, yeah. my hunch is that, you know, um, the organizations that are providing the licensure really has, that's who holds the power. Um, yeah. And so if they are saying, uh, you know, this is the criteria which you need to meet in order for your school to be accredited or for you to have your license renewed. Um, that is the way that that needs to be addressed. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of that um, being, uh, you know, integrated yeah. into as a requirement per se. There might be certain states that are doing some of those initiatives, uh, but nationally and, and that being a, a nationwide trend, I'm uncertain of. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That was, yeah, that was really helpful. Um, I'm not sure if anyone wanted to add anything else, but otherwise I don't, yeah, I think we want to keep much more of your time um, this evening or, or not maybe evening for you. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I will pass back to April, but um, thank you so much, everyone who spoke. That was, uh, that was really insightful and, yeah, really th thought provoking and you've given us a lot of resources to kind of to share, but also use ourselves. Yes, thank you so much, Bethan. Um, Ms. Garcha, I believe um, you have a question. Could you please say your name um, and the organization that you're representing? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, you can uh, see me. Hello, I'm Pravinda Singh Garcha. 
organization. I'm a trustee at um, a faith, Sikh faith institution in Southall. <clears throat> I'm also a general practitioner, what you might call a family physician in the NHS in West London. Um, my question and point was on two aspects. They're very interesting and references given are also very enlightening. Um, I wanted to find out whether there were some good examples where we could do learning from, we know that access and economic deprivation, whichever community are, are uh, sort of linked together very well. And what happens is, as we see all the figures, and it's true the world over, that if you're economically deprived or racially disadvantaged, um, you will have less access. And are there there are issues, I'm sure there are good examples, and I was just asking for good examples where we could learn from locally. And the idea of localism put forward by our colleague is very important because the problem we have, we, we have the evidence, but implementation science is not as well as advanced as we would like it. And my suggestion might have been is that there are certain examples of indigenous communities. I think Kentucky is one where uh, there's a particular tribal organization to help in, uh, empowerment and access where those kind of examples have been replicated elsewhere, shall we say, in the black and ethnic minority communities using a sort of health advocates and health champions at a local level and good examples of implementing it quite quickly so you can pick it off the shelf and attach it. But I think, I suspect, as always, there'd be resource implications and maybe lack of what you might call appropriately trained therapists who may, shall we say, not be able to ascertain the difficult minefield of mental health and associations with substance use or misuse or alcohol and other things which are all implicated. And I think the biggest factor I mean, it's, it's, it's a personal viewpoint, is the, shall I say, the working in silos of statutory and non-statutory organisations and also the non-strategy organizations are actually not empowered enough to actually take things forward in a sustainable and long-term way. And it may be that like in England that we have organizations called MIND, but again, they find it difficult to maybe address the volume or the number of black and ethnic minority mental health patients that they have. So I'm sorry, it's been a bit complicated of an issue, but I hope that you've understood. If not, I'm happy to clarify. to whoever wants to answer, just simply unmute. And we do have, we have a limited amount of time, so. I, I, I will be brief. I'm not sure if it is an answer, but uh, you know, when we talk about different contexts, Dr. Garcha is from London. So in, in UK, the major social determinant of health is education. So because you don't need income to get access to healthcare, it's a universal healthcare coverage. In the United States, the major social determinant of health is income, not education. If you have high income and you don't have money or job, then you don't have access to almost anything. So different groups, and, and in Europe, another one, in Europe, people don't collect data on race and ethnicity, and we don't have much of information about these inequalities. In UK, we have some, and in United States, we have a lot of information, but in the rest of US, Europe, we don't have much of nuances. So that is one point I wanted to make. And also we talked about uh, ethnic minority mental health care, but a lot of it comes from primary care because of the comorbidity between chronic medical conditions and mental health conditions in ethnic minority populations being very common. So it's a very good entry point for mental health care. So it, to promote mental health care of ethnic minorities, you don't just need mental health providers, you need good primary care. So that is different than privileged white who probably directly go to a mental health care facility and seek care. So I just wanted to make uh, these points clear. Thank you so much, Dr. Sorry, And thank you, Dr. Gartra for your questions. Can I just come back? The evidence that we have that economic deprivation is still a considerable factor in the UK in terms of outcomes as well as access. I'm not, I'd be happy to have the evidence where you say it is otherwise. So really good to look at that. Thank you. Sure. I don't say it is otherwise. I said main social determinant in UK is education. In Europe, 
in uh, US is income. No, everywhere there is a gradient and adversity and disadvantage, but what defines this advantage is different across uh, groups. Thank you, Dr. Sorry. I just wanted to add really quickly that um, I put two links in the chat, and I think that part of the question was um, about, um, you know, there's communities that are doing this work, and how do we find what some of that work is so that it can be replicated in other places? And so while these two links um, I did not see anything really specific. It does seem like partnerships for equity and the behavioral health equity office, both part of SAMHSA, would be a great resource to identify some of those uh, local projects. I know the first link, uh, partnerships for equity, it did have um, an expandable menu that gave some specific projects. I think it would be really great for us to, or somehow there to be a lot more awareness about SAMHSA and maybe providing a clearinghouse for which all of these uh, localities can, you know, I don't know, submit to or um, just make it easier to find. But those are two links that might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, that is unfortunately all the time we have. Um, thank you very much for attending today's event, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as we have. And thank you so much, panelists, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. Members of the audience, if you have any follow-up questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or another member of our team by visiting our website as at shrg.ngo. So once again, thank you so much for your time, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.